I have to admit, when I started to read through the Bible and I got to the book of Psalms, I didn't really like it. There was no storyline in the book of Psalms. There's no flow of theology in the book of Psalms. It seems like one psalm is really happy, praise the Lord, and one psalm is really depressed. Why, God, don't you answer me? And it was, felt super erratic. And I always wondered, like, why, why do people like the psalm so much? I don't get it. And then life happened. Has life ever happened to you? Things are going really good, and you lose your job. You get sick. A family member passes away. You get betrayed by a friend. And you're trying to sort out all these things and then you look at the Psalms and you're like, oh, 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 now these Psalms mean a lot more because now I'm feeling what they were feeling. You know, these, these Psalms, more than half of the Psalms have this tone of lament, this tone of lament where what I'm experiencing in life and what God promised me, the, those things don't feel the same. I, I look at all that he is good, that he answers prayer, that he heals, that he shows up, and yet my life is not feeling the same way that these promises say that he is. And so these psalms of lament are a cry of a genuine heart, this gritty and rough cry saying, God, where are you? Why haven't you answered? They're called psalms of disorientation because the unanswered prayer and doubt and pain and loneliness and angst that these songwriters feel is coming to the surface. And so I want to give you this idea of when we think about the lament psalms, it's almost like we're looking over the shoulder of someone who's writing a journal entry to God, and we're invited into their experience. And so we bring to these lament psalms what is actually in the psalms and then what is in us. And we use these psalms almost like a mirror. Have I ever felt that? Have I ever thought that? And we're going to find as we read these songs, or maybe better, pray these lament songs, that God will have a way to break through some of these preconceived notions, because sometimes if we're honest, we come to church, and we're like, praise the Lord, everything's good, and we all know that's a lie, because not everything is good, but that doesn't mean that God isn't good. And so we're going to deal and dive into that. And so as we go through the Psalms, you start with the Wisdom Psalm, Psalm 1, and you go right to Psalms of Praise. But when you get to Psalm 10, it sort of punches you right in the face. Here, here's how Psalm 10 starts. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Right away, the psalmist is like, this is what it feels like to be me right now. I'm here, God, you're somewhere over here. And you are far away from me, and I'm in trouble. And you said, when I was in trouble, I could call to you, and you would answer me. And so this person is feeling this gap, again, between the promises of God and their actual experience, this gap. God, I know you love me, but I'm not feeling it. God, I know you say you're with me, but I'm not seeing it. And I thought I would be farther along by them by now, but, but I'm not. And all this stuff is confusing to me. And, and so this is what, what happens when you go through a crisis. Anybody ever been through a crisis? Okay. Anybody in a crisis right now? You know, it's said in life that you're either in a crisis, coming out of a crisis, or going into a crisis. Life is full of these moments where things happen that you don't expect. And when those things happen, how do you respond? And how does it affect your relationship with God? And these, this is what the lament psalms do for us. And so Psalm 13 is one of those lament psalms that we're going to go through. It's written by David. David, the, the little boy who killed Goliath, who became king, who, who wrote about half of the psalms. Right? So this is one of his songs of lament. And we know that he's in a crisis because in a crisis... You always have more questions than you have answers. And so he's going to begin with this rapid fire set of questions to God. Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will the enemy triumph over me? David's pulling us into the fog. He's pulling us into his inner turmoil. He's saying, 
my mind is ruminating. My mind is racing. I'm wrestling with my thoughts. Anybody ever wrestle with your thoughts at night and you can't sleep? David's saying this is, this is the human condition. There are times we can't stop our minds. And the sorrow in my heart, the weight I feel for all the sadness and brokenness in my life, in my friend's life, in the world, it's sort of crushing. And my enemies are triumphing, which means injustice is winning and what is right is losing. And, and it feels like, God, you're hiding your face from me. Now, for the, the Jewish people, one of the worst things you could ever experience was God hiding his face because part of the blessing of God was that he would shine his face on his people. It was a sign of his favor. So if God would turn his back on his people or turn his face away, it was one of the worst things that you could do. And David's like, I, I need the, the presence of my God with me right now, except you feel like you're not there. And he asked this question over and over. How long? How long? How long? How long? And this is the hardest part about suffering. It's the hardest part about crisis. Is how long is it going to last? If you're in a crisis right now, and I, and I told you that in three months, two weeks, and three days, that crisis would be over, how would you feel? I know what a lot of you do. We'd circle that date on the calendar, and no matter how hard the day was, you'd be like, okay, I've only got a few months left, and then the breakthrough's going to happen, and I'm going to walk in victory. If you knew that, the way you approach crisis would be completely different. But guess what? God doesn't give you a date on the calendar when your crisis is going to end. And that psychological ambiguity makes suffering that much harder. And David is drawing us into the story, saying, have you ever felt or ever wanted to ask God how long? Well, he gives us permission to have this honest conversation. And then verse 3, look on me and answer from the Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemies will say I've overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. Is David doing what I think he's doing? Is he demanding that God answer him? Yeah, those two words, look and answer, are Hebrew imperative words. David is basically saying to God, answer me. Answer me. Now, I don't know if you've ever prayed like that. I don't know if you ever screamed at God in your car or in your pillow. But here's my question. Are you allowed to do that? Can you say that to God? God, answer me. Now, here's the beautiful thing about the Bible. We're told that David is a man after God's own heart. And this isn't the only psalm that David speaks to God that way, which means, huh, maybe God's interested in what we really think or what we really feel, because check this out. What you think about God right now, what you feel about God right now, do you think he knows? Do you think he knows what you think? Do you know, think he knows what you feel? So do you think you're fooling God to dress up your prayers and pretend like everything's all right when it's not? No, that would be a sign that you don't really trust him, that he's not really safe enough. You see, there's something powerful being modeled here for us. This desire for David, not just to check the box, to be a good follower of God or to be a good Christian, but to have an authentic relationship. David doesn't see this as a book of rules. He sees God as someone to be known, someone to wrestle with, someone to go through conflict with, and to then to be connected with. This is what it means to be in a relationship with God. I heard someone say this one time, and I never forgot it. You can say anything to God as long as you're facing him. Hmm. Think about the power of that statement. As long as you don't turn your back on him. As long as you're looking at him, desiring to understand and be connected. You can say anything to God. And here's the beautiful compliment that God allows us to give him. Who do you show your worst to? You show your worst to the person that you trust the most. So David is modeling, God, I trust you more than anyone else. I'm going to give you my worst because... My worst and darkest thoughts and feelings and emotions are all safe with you. This sort of struck us and hit us when we began taking kids in foster care into our own home. And, and many of these uh, young children would, would rage, particularly on my wife. 
And we talked to a counselor, like, why, why, why are these kids raging on her? She's taking care of them. She's feeding them. She's praying for them. She's doing all these amazing things. And the, and the counselor said, well, because they consider uh, your wife uh, the safest person in their life. And so they show that person the worst because they want to be known. They want to get out those dark feelings and emotions. And it sort of struck me. The person you freak out on is the person you trust the most. And David's freaking out on God and God's saying, that's okay, keep telling it to me. I know it's in there. And he's drawing it out of David. So David, as he's throwing all this stuff out, he sort, of, he sort of catches himself. And in verse five, he says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. So I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. This moment where in the middle of the song, he says, but here's how I feel, but I'm not going to trade what I don't know for what I do know. I do know that God, and he uses his personal name, Yahweh, Jehovah. I know my God by name and his unfailing love. That's the word hesed. And in and, and almost all the lament songs, they turn on this singular word, hesed. God, your faithful love that always pursues me, that never gives up on me, when I don't deserve it, when I can't earn it, you always love me. This is the pursuing, inexhaustible love of God. Are you grateful for that love, the hesed love of God over your life? It's always coming after you. And so David says, even though the crisis is not over, look, look at this, I will sing. It's his act of defiance to all the things in his life that are wanting to separate him from God. It's his act of resistance to say, I'm going to worship even in the dark because I know the character of my God. I'm not going to let this crisis own me. I'm not going to let this crisis crush me. I'm going to turn to my good God. And, and this is a psalm of lament, this genuine cry of the heart to God. And, and every one of these songs of lament and there's so many in the book of Psalms. They follow a very similar pattern. Here's the pattern. Life is good. I'm oriented. I, 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 everything sort of makes sense. I've trusted God. I've prayed. And, and, and he's blessing me. And these things are thriving. I've avoided evil. And, and everything's good. And then all of a sudden life happens. And, and now there's a sense of, uh, now I'm disoriented because I'm in a crisis. And now I don't know what to think or feel. Was all that happened with God real? Is, was that worship thing real? Was that answered prayer? Is it real or is it just my imagination? And then, finding your way back to God. I trust in God. I'm reoriented back to God. And we're going to see this pattern. In, in the next Psalm of Man, it's, it's Psalm 42. So just take your Bible and just turn a couple pages to the right, and you're going to see in Psalm 42. Now, a Psalm of Man, not written by David, but written by the sons of Korah. So now this is maybe a decade or so later that the temple is built. So we know it's later. The sons of Korah come from a really bad family background, and now they're worship leaders in Israel. So that's just to say, if you come from a really bad background, you're like, could God use me because my family's a, a train wreck? Yeah, God loves to take the biggest train wrecks and make them the, the beautiful acts of his glory and grace. That, this is what he does. So if you come from a, a difficult family or you come from a place where I wasn't a Christian, my whole family doesn't know Jesus, and you're the first one, he wants to use you in powerful ways for his kingdom. So don't let your history uh, get in the way of the legacy God has for your life. This is the psalm of Korah. And you see that phrase at the very beginning of the song? It's a maskil. A maskil is uh, a song of instruction, which means that these worship leaders that are writing these songs are teaching people how to lament. They're teaching them. David wrote a song of lament for his, his best friend, Jonathan, and his, his his, Jonathan's dad, Saul, and he said, I, I'm going to teach Israel how to lament, how to mourn, how to cry out to God. And so this pattern has been repeated through the Psalms. So here's Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Now, maybe you recognize the, the beginning of the Psalm because well, that is that beautiful song. As the deer pants for water, so my soul cries out for you. And th that's one of your like intimate songs with Jesus. And you, you can sit in a quiet place and like, oh, that's such a beautiful song. And I feel so connected and so intimate. Yeah, that's not what this song is about. Okay, so sorry to ruin that for everybody. And we know this song is not about that because the next line tells you what this person is thinking about their desire to connect with God. Verse three, my tears have been my food day and night. 
while people say to me all day long, where is your God? And these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. So the sons of Korah are saying, hey, there are times where I can't sleep at night and I cry so much that those tears become my food and my drink. That's how rough it's been. And people are ridiculing me. They're saying, where's your God? And I remember when I used to be close to God, when I used to worship and celebrate, and now that feels like such a distant memory. Have you ever been so sad you weren't able to eat? Have your mind ever been so busy you weren't able to sleep? Have you ever had a moment where you're like, I remember these really beautiful, intimate moments in worship and in prayer and in reading God's word, and that was like five years ago. I haven't felt that in a really long time. I don't know, is there something wrong with me? I don't know, is there something wrong with you, God? I'm not really sure what to think or feel. This is that disorientation that the psalmists are bringing to us. So, so verse five, here's what the, the psalmist is gonna say. He's gonna speak to himself. Anybody here talk to themselves? You talk to yourself when you're in the car by yourself? Okay, so, all right, so this, this is modeling talking to your own soul. And we're gonna see this happen a couple times in the psalm. So if you talk to yourself, you're not crazy. It's actually biblical. So someone laughs at you, just say, hey, this is what the Bible teaches us to do. <laughs> Verse five, he's gonna to talk to his own soul. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? All right, so he's like, I'm feeling all this stuff, and I, I don't know, why, why are you so depressed? Why are you so downcast? Why, why are you so disturbed? And then he's gonna to preach to himself. He says, Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. He, he, he's, he's doing the self-talk. Why are you so depressed? Why are you so downcast? No, stop it. Snap out of it. Put your hope in God. You can trust in him. He's good. And then he goes back down. Look at the next verse, verse 6. No, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan, heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. So remember how he starts the song? There's no water. I'm parched. I'm thirsty. I'm going to die of dehydration. And now there's so much water I can't breathe. The, the waves come over me. The waterfall comes over me. It deep cries to deep. There's something in me that I can't. And, and here's the image. This is a person that's like being shoved underwater. And every time they get a chance to get the top, they go, oh, take a breath. And then shoved underwater and struggling. And next time they come, oh, take a breath. And this is what they're going through in their mind, in their heart. Again, you start to think like, ah, oh, I know what that was like. Or I know what that's like right now. I feel that way. And then the question is, what do you, what do, you do with that? Well, you, you keep on battling because in verse 8, we're going to see the personal name of God. And we're going to see that word has said again. By day, the Lord directs his love, his hesed. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. He finds himself rooted back in God. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Up and down, up and down, fighting for every breath. And then he goes back. To the self-talk one more time. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. This is an honest cry from an honest worshiper of God trying to figure out this gap between who God says he is and what he's experienced in his own life but he's leaning into that gap. He's fighting for air. He's remembering what's true. He's not forgetting what is true and trading it for what he, he doesn't know, what's ambiguous about the future. And this is the life of faith. David and the, and the sons of Kor and everyone who writes a song of lament like this, they're modeling this honest self-awareness about how they feel and what they think. Now, I grew up in a family where very uh, infrequently did someone ever say, how do you feel? People would ask me the question, what do you think? Anybody grow up in a family like this, where you don't know how to express emotions, especially negative emotions? Six honest people, okay. Yeah, you know you're out there. You know you're out there. I see you. And so 
I happen to marry um, a woman who has a master's degree in social work. Okay, that was like a setup from God, whatever. So she would start asking me the questions. How do you feel about this? And I'd be like, that's a stupid question. <laughs> Ask me what I think. I can give you the answer to that question. And so she'd always like throw up these little images of like these feeling wheels. You ever see these feeling wheels? All right, so we put one of these in the QR code for you to look at later, for you to actually examine. Like, are you feeling, are you feeling insecure or rejected or confused or hurt or threatened or distant? This is like inside out all over again. Lonely, <laughs> bored, sad. I, I, don't, I don't really know how, how I feel. But here's what a lot of Christians can do. We, we take those feelings and we just stuff them down. We do the whole spiritual bypass thing. Oh, a friend just got a cancer diagnosis. Well, praise the Lord, God could heal him. Oh, this relationship that was a decade long just broke up. Well, God can redeem all things. He can use all things together for good to those who love. And what's happening? What's happening is we don't stop and sit and feel that emotion. We just spiritually bypass it. We detach from it. Or some people are like, I can't handle these much. I'm just going to take a drink. So I'm going I'm to drug this feeling. I'm going to deny this feeling. I'm going to detach from this feeling. And the psalmists are saying, no, no, don't. Whatever you do, don't do that. Bring your emotions, your real self to God. So, so this week, someone gave me this perfect, beautiful analogy for what we're supposed to do with our feelings. They said, your feelings are like a two-year-old. You don't put a two-year-old in the trunk of your car because you will go to jail. <laughs> but you also don't give your two-year-old the keys to the car. Ah. Oh. Don't take your feelings and put them in the trunk. Don't pretend like they don't matter or that they're not real or they're going to stay in that trunk. They're going to come out. But also don't be led by your feelings. So this simple idea, how do I own my feelings without enthroning my feelings? And if we as the people of God can learn that from these songs of lament, well, we will be well served by God's word because pain is a trailhead. It leads us somewhere. It leads us to a source. And if we're curious enough and we take enough time, why do I feel this sense of angst or sadness or dissonance? Let, let me just sit with that for a second. Let me, let me search with God and ask him to show me. C.S. Lewis, this great Christian thinker, uh, married this woman who was then diagnosed with cancer. And she suffered and died right next to him, right in front of him. And he was so angry at God. But he didn't just stay in his anger. He, he sat in it long enough. And then he, he wrote this. I sat with my anger long enough until she told me her real name it was grief. What would happen? What would happen if we sat with our feelings long enough to find out what they really were? You know, every, every week at this church, there's this sacred space where men and women sit together in something called grief share. We have a friend named Ava who leads this group, and she leads this group for, for moms and dads who have lost children. And they sit in this space and they share stories about their children who passed away. And there are tears. Sometimes moments of laughter and memory in connection. And when my wife and I, who also lost our son, sat in that group a couple months ago, we could feel this powerful connection as people shared their stories. As people cried, not just for other people's stories, but cried for their own stories. You know, it's, it's often easier to cry for someone else's story than it is for your own story. Because to cry for someone else's story, well, the Bible says, weep with those who weep. It feels like something that, that you're called to, but to weep for your own story, well, that means you gotta give up a sense of control. You gotta make yourself vulnerable. And in these sacred and beautiful spaces around the church, there are people who wanna sit with you to teach you how to do this. Because if pain is a trailhead, there are people, men and women, who've gone down that trail a hundred times and can lead you in this process. And so the Psalms are tutoring our souls to say, go down that trail. There is healing and restoration in God if you're just honest and gritty and raw with what you're feeling. And so we're gonna, we're gonna practice that here. 
we're just going to take a moment. And I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And I want you to sit in the presence of God and not think about what anyone else around you thinks. And just let God search your heart and search your mind. Whether this question applies to something that happened last week or 10 years ago, I want you to sit in the presence of God. Because if you want to know what's going on in your soul, you're not going to find it in prosperity. You're going to find it in adversity. And so here's, here's the first question. Answer this question in the presence of God. I felt angry when? Take a moment. Just name it and, and then let yourself feel that emotion and then offer it to God. Next question. I felt sad when? I wanted revenge when I felt abandoned when Maybe for some of you, just one of those four questions began to bring things up, and I want to encourage you that to follow that question, to follow what's coming up in your heart, because that's not going to all happen in a few minutes of quiet reflection in a church. We want to process together with other people or in the presence of God. A counselor once told me that depression is this accumulation of unprocessed grief. And so I want to ask you just two more questions. Is there any unprocessed grief in your life? I want you to go back through your whole life. Any unprocessed grief? And then maybe the hardest question of all, is there an area of your life where you're disappointed with God? Sit with that for a moment. Whatever came up, whatever you want to say to God, I want you to know he can take it. He's not interested in a son or daughter who does all the right things. He's interested in a son or daughter who wants a relationship with him. He is a good father. And one of the things that we want to provide you as a church 
Well, I've invited Ava and some leaders of our grief share team, some people from our cancer care team, some people from our divorce care team, some people from our celebrate recovery team to be in the lobby at the close of the service. You're like, I need, I need to follow that question. I need to, I need to grieve that loss. I need healing. I need to, I didn't realize I had so much inside of me. And today, if you decide, I don't want to be a person who spiritually bypasses or detaches from those things. And these Psalms give us permission to go on that journey and to find real healing and real hope in God. I want to encourage you to take that next step. So lament Psalms in the Bible are not just personal. They're also corporate. They're also national. Psalm 44 just two psalms away, is a psalm of national lament. It's the people of God, the Jewish people, crying to God, saying, God, why have you forsaken us? They start out by saying, you were with us in battle. You helped us to win victories, but now you don't go out with our armies anymore. Psalm 44, verse 9, you've rejected us. You've humbled us. You've made us retreat. You've plundered us. Our enemies devour and scatter us. We are a reproach, a byword. We're in disgrace. We live in shame. We are crushed by our enemies. I'm saying, God, aren't you with us? You're the God of Israel. That's us. We're your people. And so here's their cry of lament. Awake, Lord. Why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us. Rescue us because of your Unfailing love, Hesed, there it is again. If we can learn anything from the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, it's for centuries. There have been people who've tried to destroy and extinguish this race of people. Think about the story of Esther in the Bible, the genocide there. You think about Hitler's genocide. You think about the way that they process grief together, even my wife and I have been to Israel several times. They'll stop at a certain day, and everyone will stop, and they'll lament. They're not just crying. They're remembering before God. If you watch what happened to Israel this week, as they lamented October 7th, as they lamented what happened to those people and what happened to those hostages, they, they sit in that pain. They stop everything and give it space, and they bring that lament to God. And something beautiful happens. And we can learn so much, not just about personal lament, but about the corporate laments in the Bible. You see, in our Western American mindset, we don't know how to lament. We don't know how to deal with a nation that had centuries of slavery and the horrible things that human beings did to other human beings. We don't know what to do with that. We don't know how to talk about it. We don't know how to talk about the hundreds of thousands of unborn children that have been killed in this country. So what do we do? We blame people. We get angry at people. We politicize issues. We demonize people. But how much better off would we be as a nation if we actually lamented these things? We had sadness for these things. We took whatever anger and sorrow and offered it to God. Something beautiful could happen. And so I pray during a season where there's so much sadness and anger and division that uh, these songs teach us to lament and bring these things before God. And, and, and these lament psalms, they give way to something even harder to understand. They're called the imprecatory psalms. These are psalms of rage. These are psalms of, of rage toward enemies. And here's, here's one of them. In the middle of Psalm 139, this, this beautiful psalm of praise. David writes, Oh God, if only you would destroy the wicked. Get out of my life, you murderers. They blaspheme you. Your enemies misuse your name. Oh Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with total hatred. For your enemies are my enemies. What do we do with that? That's raw emotion. And what the psalmist is inviting us to is there are some things that we should be angry about. You think of those who abuse children. Those who use sexual violence. 
as a way to show they can be in control and nothing can touch them. Those who take elderly and vulnerable people and manipulate them because they can. Those who use raw power for evil purposes. And, and the, the psalmist is saying, this rage I feel toward those people, God, I'm, I'm offering to you. Do you see it? Do you feel it? And God does share that same wrath and anger toward evil and toward sin and toward injustice. And so something beautiful is happening. The Bible says you take rage and you keep it to yourself and you look to act it out. But that type of rage, that type of vengeance would destroy us. These psalms of lament, these psalms of rage, notice David is addressing God. Oh God, this is how I feel. Oh God, I'm taking my rage, I'm putting it before you because my rage is safest before you. Because you can do something with this that I can't. And that's why Christians have been encouraged in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. God, you take care of this. So if you answer that question, I felt this need for revenge when this person did this thing. Well, I want to say that what that person did to you this doesn't mean that doesn't matter. As New Testament Christians, here's what we understand. If you can think of the person who hurt you worse than anyone else has hurt you your entire life. You got that person in your mind's eye? Now, let's just pretend like we're not in church. What would you want to do to them? And you're like, are we allowed to think about this? Yeah, just for a minute. <laughs> what would you like to do to them for what they did to you? I don't know, I'm, I'm just gonna talk out loud. I'd like, to, I'd like to put them in front of all of, of their friends and family and expose them for the person they actually are. Spit in their face, punch them in the back of the head, strip them naked, humiliate them, kill them, but not quickly, slowly. You're like, Doug, what's wrong? Listen, 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 listen. <laughs> Slowly. So they feel every lash, every punch, every bit of humiliation for all they did to me or my family. I want them to feel that full amount of wrath and vengeance. And here's the crazy, powerful, mysterious truth that all that you want to do to that person, Jesus stood in that place for them. He took a beating. They stripped him naked. They humiliated him. They mocked him. They punched him in the face. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They, they made him die the slowest, most excruciating death that human beings could ever have invented. He stood in the place of that sexual perpetrator of that person who manipulated you, that person who betrayed you, that person who broke their promise and never came back for you. He stood in all their place, and then when he cried his last breath, he said, it is finished. Jesus knows something about lament. He sung these songs on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried at Lazarus, his best friend's funeral, even though he knew he was gonna raise him from the dead. He is a man of sorrows. He understands. He sees you and knows you, and he's not leaving you in your pain, in your sadness, in your anger. He's joining you in it. And so the lament psalms are us speaking to God, but if God could say something back, I know the first thing he would say to you today is, I see you. And so we're going to sing a song over you. I want you to hear this as the words of God to you, how much he loves you and how much he doesn't want you to give up on him. Let's listen to this song together. Prayer you pray, 
Though I answered all the time, you just didn't hear my reply. And I know it's not easy. Don't you give up on me. Don't you give up on me. Cause the darker the night gets, the brighter the light hits. Don't you give up on me. Don't you give up on me. Yeah. You ain't seen what I promised. Child, we're just getting started. And I'll be your way when there's no way out. And I'll be your strength when your strength runs out. And if you walk into the fire, I'll be right there in the flames. I wouldn't have it any other way. Cause loving you's easy. Don't you give up on me. Don't you give up on me. Cause the darker the night gets, the brighter the light hits. Don't you give up on me. Don't you give up on me. You ain't seen what I promised. Child, we're just getting started. Open your heart, open your hands, open your eyelids. I've got more dreams, I've got more plans, I've got more blessings. Don't lose your hope, don't lose your faith, that's where your fight is. I've got more dreams, I've got more plans, I've got more blessings. Open your heart, open your hands, open your eyelids. I've got more dreams, I've got more plans, I've got more blessings. Don't lose your hope, don't lose your faith, that's where your fight is. I've got more dreams, I've got more plans, I've got more blessings. Don't you give up on me, don't you give up on me. Cause the darker the night gets, the brighter the light hits. Don't you give up on me, don't you give up on me. You ain't seen what I promised. Child, we're just getting started. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the beautiful thing about our God. If you're a mess, God doesn't say, hey, go get your life all together. And then when you got it all figured out, come back to me and we'll talk. God says, open your eyes. Open your hands. Let's, let's sort out all those things. I want to do this with you. I want to get in the grit. I want to get my fingers dirty with you. You see, whatever you're going through, God, God knows and understands. Jesus walked in human skin. He knows what it's like to watch people around him that he loved die. He go through sickness. He knows what it's like to be betrayed by friends. And so when, when I process in my life the death of my son Jordan, my wife and I, as we process the betrayal of a friend, as we process things we thought God was gonna do that he didn't do, as we process all of those things in the presence of God and bring those questions to him, something, something beautiful happens. It doesn't drive us away from God, it drives us closer to God because there's something about adversity and knowing there's a God who will never give up on you. A God you can say anything to. And he'll still be there the next morning, waiting with new mercy and grace. And so at the close of the service, there's going to be an altar full of people that want to pray with you and help you process. There's going to be a lobby full of people that, 
Maybe wanna help you take that next step on your healing journey, but before we do that, I know that there are some people in this room that you haven't started a relationship with God yet. You sort of curiously come back to church, maybe because of a crisis, maybe because you're in disorientation, you're trying to figure out, maybe, maybe God's the one I need in my life, and I just wanna say that that is who you need. And so we wanna give you an opportunity. If you've never started a relationship with God, and I wanna say this, not that you don't believe in God, not that you don't believe in the Bible, not that you don't believe that Jesus died on a cross for the sins of the world. I'm not talking about just that. I'm talking about this, this thing that God wants to do to make it real, to make it personal, to say, Jesus, you died for me. You came for me. You came to be my redeemer, and I put my faith and my trust in you. I repent of my sins, and I believe that you are my substitute on the cross, and I want to experience this new life you have for me. Today, if you want to experience new life in Christ, we're, we're going to sing the words to a song, Lord, I need you. And for those of you who know Jesus, this, this can be your worship moment. Lord, I need you. This is true of everyone in this room. We all need God in our lives. We all need the power and mercy of his grace and of his presence. But for those of you who want to start a relationship with him, as this song begins to play, I'm going to ask you to stand up, to walk toward this altar. And, and I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer at the close of this song. A simple prayer. Because God is only a prayer way. And he's waiting for you today, if that's you, wherever you are. Stand and walk this way and we will celebrate with all of heaven as you come. If that's you, come. so excited for you and celebrating with all of heaven. So here's the amazing thing about God. He's seen you your whole life. He's watched every road you've walked down. Even some roads you knew you shouldn't walk down that you did. And he let you walk down those roads. Right? But he knew that on this date, October 13th, he was gonna meet you here. And he was gonna begin to do something new in your life. And the thing is, he knows everything about what's about to happen next in your life. And he has a plans for you that are good plans. And so as you pray this prayer, you're committing to his plan for your life. As you pray this prayer, the most powerful words that you ever say your entire life will come out of your mouth because the Bible says, by your confession, you are saved. Your name is gonna be written in a book called the Book of Life. You're gonna be adopted as a son or daughter of God. God's gonna fill you with his spirit and begin the work of new creation in you. That doesn't mean tomorrow's gonna to be perfect, all green lights and rainbows, but it means even in the difficulty now, God's presence is with you and in you. And that's why we say it's a relationship with Jesus that changes everything. It's from the inside out. And so you're about to be on the greatest adventure of your life and 
And we're honored and privileged to be part of this moment. So I'm gonna pray a prayer. I'm gonna have you repeat this prayer. But before I do, I just wanna offer one more moment for anybody who's out there. God loves procrastinators. I was a procrastinator. If you know you should be up here and you're wrestling back and forth and you're like, it's too late, it's not too late, just get up out of your seat and come up here. And we want to celebrate the redemption of God in your life because he has come to save those who are lost and far away. His grace is coming after you out of love. Come on. Come on, church, let's celebrate these decisions and let's keep praying as people have the courage to take this step. Come on. Let heaven hear this applause as the people of God celebrate new life and the people that are here. We're really glad you're here. All right. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Welcome. Come on. loves you so much. You guys are worth the wait, every one of you, every one. This is the kindness and patience of God in your life. He waited for you. And so now I'm going to offer this prayer. I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer out loud to God. He will hear this prayer and he will answer this prayer because we have a God who makes promises and keeps promises. So say this out loud to God. Say this, Lord God, I open my heart and I invite you inside. Forgive my sin. Today I repent. Now fill me with your spirit, and I will walk with you all the days of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, guys. Congratulations, and welcome to the family of God. So, before you go back to your seats, I want to ask you for five more minutes. You just made the most important decision of your life. I want to ask you to follow me and the guys that are waving their hands over to that open door where we're going to give you a Bible as a gift and have one conversation with you. You'll be back with your friends in five minutes. So follow me this way. Church, let's give them a hand as they go that way. And let's close in a song of praise to our God who is worthy of it in the highs, in the lows of life. And if you need prayer for any reason at all, at the close of this song, there's going to be prayer counselors to pray with you. Let's worship.
thanks for joining us again this weekend. If you need prayer for anything, as Pastor Doug said, the prayer team will be gathered in front of the stage. If not, we'll see you soon on your way out. Grab those food chair bags. We'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to today's message. You know, here at Calvary, we believe a relationship with Jesus changes everything. And if you've decided to follow Jesus, we'd love for you to text the word BELIEVE to 31352 so you can find out what it means to follow Christ. And to learn more about Calvary and all of our campuses, you're free to visit calvaryftl.org.